What's up, everybody? Ryan from Sports Card Radio. Sunday, April 2nd. That's right. No jokes. Today, we're back for another episode. Got some things to discuss and also uh, kind of putting a little bow on some of our discussion about eBay and Amazon. What did I do for the entire month of March in terms of sales? And then we'll also touch on check out my cards because I had a huge month on check out my cards in terms of my history. So uh, throw that in there as well. A couple other things though we're going to touch on. A couple things I noticed in the hobby. Connor McDavid $250 Young Guns. Uh, both one both astonishing and made me a little cringe a little bit because I've had about four of these. I bought them I think in the $125, $150 range. I don't think I ever traded for one. I think I had to buy the four I had. Traded three. I still have one. I get trade offers every day on up. It's sitting on the Upper Deck EPAC website. Pulled it. I pulled one from a pack. And then I think I bought three of them. I think that's how it went. So I still have one left. And I sold an Austin Matthews Young Gun card that I pulled on EPAC. Sold it on Check Out My Cards for 150 And just while I was on Check Out My Cards, I checked out what the Connor McDavid was selling for. And they're selling for $250. So uh, we'll talk about that because I think that's very interesting. And that's a big number for a card that wasn't that hard to get. Again, I had four of them at one point. The industry summit is coming up. It, I, it might actually have already started. And I may or may not be banned, but I won't be going. But we'll talk about a little bit about just kind of some of the things that might happen there or won't happen. And uh, just some general themes about retail brick and mortar, which is a heavy topic of discussion at the industry summit couple quick notes before we dive into those three topics uh saw the elite eight women's basketball game that was held in stockton south carolina versus florida state south carolina clearly the better team florida state came back late and made it a game of things i just saw i think south carolina went on to win the women's national title connecticut get got upset along the way there somewhere funny thing i saw was the hottest ticket really in sports in the last couple months is minus like something like the super bowl and hamilton or something like that was this ncaa women's title game uh south carolina and who was it oregon or no it wasn't oregon i don't even remember who they were playing $500 $500 get in ticket. Uh, tickets were selling for thousands of dollars. Tickets ran out super quick. Um, so, one of the best investments you could have made was acquiring a bunch of NCAA women's title game tickets. I had zero. I, ha- I went to the Elite Eight game, which wasn't sold out. I wish that was a hot ticket in Stockton. I have some hooks. Uh, and I would have been able to get uh, quite a few tickets if for whatever reason, maybe it was too, they talked about if it was two local teams like Stanford and Oregon, that uh, the game might have sold out and it might have been uh, some secondary action there, which would have been really, really fun for me to sell uh, tickets to an event right up the street from me. So just thought I'd throw that out there. Hottest ticket in sports right now, the NCAA women's title game that just happened. And Masters tickets, I'm hearing, are on fire, too. So that's uh, super interesting. Also, uh, opportunity came up super close to where I live, like literally right across the street from where I live, about a 600-square-foot office. They're going to redo the floors and the paint and the lighting and a door and all this stuff for me. I needed an office. I wanted to hire somebody to kind of handle a lot of my stuff that isn't associated with tickets a lot of this website stuff um so hopefully i can get somebody in there in the next couple of months they're finishing up the work there and uh i'll be able to move over some of this crap that i have for sale on ebay and amazon over to this office nice size office has a large kind of 
room and then a smaller office on the back and uh not bad send me something uh take this down get your pen out get your phone out and uh send me something 45 45 georgetown place suite c 34 stockton just like it sounds s-t-o-c-k-t-o-n california zip code 95207 that address again 4545 georgetown place suite c34 stockton california 95207 send me something drop by during business hours shoot me an email first because i may not be there but uh hit me up so i think the i think uh I, I had to apply for another LLC, and I think the business is NorCal Tickets. I'm not really sure what I'm going to be doing out of there. It's conveniently located, again, right across the street from me and in between one of the largest junior colleges and another private university that's 50000 bucks to go to school there. So I think I can find some young, hungry uh, person to come in there. I'm literally going to start them on sports cards updating some things on sports card radio updating some things on different websites and then uh beanie babies i have a boatload i i have a full-time position (laughs) if necessary for beanie babies so kind of start a person down the road of creating some content managing like email lists and social media accounts and just see how you know what type of skills this person has because they could literally run my entire internet online business probably pack and ship all my ebay stuff maybe do some research as far as products goes could do a lot of things basically be a glorified personal assistant but do quite a bit more for me and be able to do it out of a an office and stuff so like it's another thing i was looking for more ways to spend money on my business and one way to do that is you know get a 600 square foot office i'm gonna have to get internet i'm gonna have to get furniture i'm probably gonna have to get a couple computers uh, there's going to be quite a few expenses shelling out the door in the next couple of months. And then obviously if you're hiring somebody, you got to pay them, uh, above minimum wage. If you're asking them to do a bunch of this website work and all this kind of stuff. So I think the hardest thing for me is really going to be, uh, finding somebody who's going to be able to do all this and kind of grasp it and take it all in and be able to execute it. And hopefully over, you know, however long they're in school or maybe for a year, maybe hopefully longer um that's gonna be i think my greatest challenge i had an office before it was a little further away from me and i didn't i never got there enough and it was only about 150 square feet or so and this one is like literally right across the street from where i live and uh you know it's a little little super ghetto down here you know strap on your your kevlar and uh you know Come, come pack in your heat if you do come visit me because it is a little, uh, it's, <laughs> it's more than a little uh, ghetto out in these uh, parts. You know, we had a little Dr. Dre to start the, the, uh, the show. So nothing but a G thing, baby. But so those two little things, saw some women's uh, title game. Can't believe those tickets were five hundred dollars each to the titles game just to get in. I mean, it's astonishing. Those are probably only hundred dollar tickets, hundred and quarter maybe uh, at best there. So that's uh, just blows my mind. Connor McDavid. Maybe most of you don't even know who this kid is. Number one pick in uh, one of the hockey drafts. I don't know that much about him. I know that you know supposedly he's, you know, the LeBron James, the Michael Jordan, the next greatest thing to ever come to hockey and sure enough, seems like he is. He got hurt when he first came up last year, his rookie year, kind of was playing really well, but he got hurt pretty early on in the season and missed an extended period of time, but came back, I think played really well. There's been like little kind of uh, USA Canada tournaments uh, since then. And uh, I think he's really, I didn't check the stats, but I'm sure he's blowing it up this season. Last year on EPAC, this was the first product to come out. 2015-16 Upper Deck Series 1 hockey. And it featured the Connor McDavid Young Gun rookie card. Oh man, why didn't I look this up? I bought so many of these cards. There's only about 30 Young Guns, I think, in the whole set. And they're one in four packs. Really isn't that hard to get, get one. Again, I probably only bought about four boxes of this thing. I pulled one. 
uh, and I bought you. You definitely I wouldn't advise going and trying to buy cards on the EPAC forum now. I think they're trying to like shut down. They they like try to shut down accounts that do that. But I was on there so early that it was a little bit of a wild 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 west situation. People could say, hey, I got a McDavid for a buck and a quarter. PayPal, I'll do this now if you want. And I would do it because. I needed cards to trade. I didn't want to open a whole bunch of boxes and spend that much. Why not just buy the best card for 125 when the box itself cards cost 99? I might as well just buy the card everybody wants. So I did that several times. I ended up trading those usually down. I would get like, I don't know, five Larkin um, Young Guns and some Panarins. That ends up not being uh, the smartest thing. These Connor McDavid 2015-16 upper deck series one young guns one of the most mass produced hockey sets in the last five or ten years <laughs> this thing is selling for 250 dollars now last year these cards held real steady at a buck and a quarter 150 all year even after he got hurt if you got one of these for under 100 bucks on ebay or check out my cards consider yourself lucky and I know just from spending time on the Upper Deck EPAC forum, congrats to you guys out there who were hoarding these suckers, shaking people down for these, trading for these cards, getting three off me when I had four. Congrats to you guys. I know of some people who have 20, 40, 50, over 100 of these Connor McDavid Young Gun cards that, again, are, were not that difficult to get most of the other young guns aside from Panarin, Larkin, Domi, a couple other guys worth a buck here, the buck there aren't worth nothing. They're worth 25 cents to a buck each. This Connor McDavid is worth $250. Trust me, if you had one, you could snap get a guaranteed $250, $240 on checkout my cards made me feel a little bad because i had in austin matthews the uh, quote unquote the next hottest thing here in hockey another number one pick came up i think he had a hat trick and or four goals in one of his first game or maybe his first game he had four goals something absolutely insane again i got lucky uh, bought two boxes pulled an austin matthews young gun had it for a while uh have considered trading it Again, another card that has held steady in that hundred and quarter, hundred and fifty dollar range. Uh, good luck finding one of these for under a hundred dollars shipped or uh, on checkout my cards. This set, however, the Austin Matthews set is uh, has a there are a lot less Austin Matthews than there are Connor McDavid's. This is a less produced set, the Austin Matthews. So I feel a little bad that I put 150, that I took 150. Uh, I think if I had looked to seen what the McDavid's were selling for, I had, again, I had no idea that they were selling for 250. I probably would have held on to the Matthews. Now, a strategy that I, I could have, because I do have a Connor McDavid sitting on the Upper Deck EPAC site that I could eat, snap trade for in a second. Maybe I can trade it for to Austin Matthews, which would be really good. I think I probably would. If somebody offered me two Austin Matthews for my Connor McDavid, I think I would take it. Now, <laughs> I caution to say this Connor McDavid has a better chance of going to 500 than it does ever seeing 100 again, unless he breaks his ankle or just falls off the face of the earth. These things could hit 500, 1,000. Again, there are people who hoarded these things. I don't know if they're keeping them for life or if they're waiting for them to hit 1,000. Or they. There are guys who have hundreds of these cards, not only on Upper Deck EPAC, but guys who did monster case breaks and breaks and breaks and breaks. 2015 16 hockey saved Upper Decks company. You wonder why EPAC came out of nowhere. You wonder why this, the summit, this, um, uh, uh, Upper Deck Diamond Dealer Conference that they threw themselves in Phoenix popped up out of nowhere. The money they made on these Connor McDavid uh, cards, rookie year cards, especially 2015-16 Series 1 was astonishing. They cranked up the print run. But wow, these cards are still worth $250. And it really hammers home the point 
uh, I've touched on this on this podcast many different times, how there are hobby shops, there are distributors, there are dealers who are really against Upper Deck EPAC. They feel like it floods the market with these low value cards. It hurts dealers. It hurts uh, hobby shops. It hurts distributors. Blah, 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 blah. Because that's what the fuck it is. It's blah, blah, blah. They overproduced fucking 2015-16 Upper Deck Series 1 and this motherfucker's rookie card is worth $250. So you fucking hobby shops out there and you distributors and I could go on and on and name them. I've read letters that they've written against Upper Deck EPAC. Motherfuckers, when you get a guy like Connor McDavid's card, you can't print enough of those fucking cards. It's a $250 card. They overproduced it. I know guys that have over a hundred of them. I have four of them and I wouldn't recognize the guy if he walked by me on the street and introduced himself as Connor McDavid. It would still take me a second to be like, oh, oh, the hockey player. Hey, what's up, buddy? How's it going? Your shit's worth 250. Can you sign this napkin? Bottom line, fuck you. This dude's card is worth 250 fucking dollars. A little heated. I always have to like start and stop these fucking podcasts because I get these random, my phone starts blowing up. Emily, Emily Blodgett, who works at Uno Pizzeria and Grill in Plattsburgh, New York, I got to turn off these Facebook notifications. Here's what she says. Hi, just curious. I have the Beanie Babies kicks dated 1998-1999. I was doing research and have noted there are three errors to the ones and are rare and that have value. I noted the date error, but I am unsure of the other two look like. Would you be able to help me out with that? If it helps, I can send images. Also, is it worth any value? What would it be? Thank you in advance. So these messages come in. All first of all, it's not a date error on the 1998-1999 kicks, but not to bore you on Beanie Babies, but just a little fucking taste of what I have to fucking deal with. Uh, again, 45, 45 Georgetown Place, C34, Stockton, California, 95207. Taking people, taking applications. For people who know fucking something about the internet who are down to fucking make some money. And who can handle some of this Beanie Baby shit. Industry Summit. Good time to be fucking talking about this. This ties in a little bit to EPAC. First of all, rumor going around. I haven't confirmed it yet, so I, I'm not blasting this out on. But rumor has it, no Panini black boxes this year at the Industry Summit. Wow. No upper deck. What the fuck happened to this Industry Summit? That the year I went and was blowing this shit up on Twitter, he had record fucking attendance. He had fucking other websites giving him like thousands of dollars to quote sponsor the event. I mean, some of these fucking people are so stupid in this industry. And Kevin Isaacson is one of them. He fucking got pissed at me for tweeting when literally Cardboard Connection, dude wouldn't even know what the industry summit was. But he saw me blow that shit up the year before on Twitter. So then he calls Kevin Isaacson and quote unquote sponsors the event for like $2,500. It's like, Kevin, why do you think you got that check? Because of M-E, period, motherfucker. It's going to be the same old show at the Industry Summit. The same guys asking the same questions. And you're not going to give get a whole lot of answers from Panini, Tops, and Upper Deck may or may not even be there. They're going to act like they care about you for a couple days at best this is a way for distributors to get some new customers at best this is a way that if you can afford it you can get out to vegas steam some shit off in the craps uh, room do not stay at the tropic i think this is at the tropicana guys rooms are cheap next week especially after the 
the NCAA uh, event ends. Go to the Vidara. It'll be 150 bucks. Go to the Signature, which is super close. You could walk over back over the Tropicana. It wouldn't be that far. Stay at the MGM Signature for like a hundo. Do yourself a favor. Be smart. Again, I blew this fucking thing up. I blew the fucking industry summit up because of social media. It's really social media's credit. I was just the guy typing the things into it. This guy could have this thing fucking 500,000 people at this event. He could have people doing podcasts in the fucking aisleways in the Tropicana or wherever. He could have people renting out conference rooms to talk to people, potential business people. But no, they don't they don't like to do that. And a lot of these brick and mortar guys like to, you know, point fingers. Again, I hear it all the time with EPAC. We just talked about the Connor McDavid. Motherfuckers complained in writing. Again, it's in writing from a distributor. Complaints about upper deck. EPAC. That was a huge thing actually last year at the Industry Summit. Was guys hobby shops complaining about how Upper Deck EPAC was gonna eat into their business. Motherfucker, his shit's worth two hundred fifty dollar card. You should have been instead of complaining, you should have been buying them for a hundred, hundred and a quarter each on eBay, and you should have been on Upper Deck EPAC because you could have got a hundred to a thousand of them by just shaking people down at some trades. So fuck you. Second of all, a little more educational front, Sports Business Journal. I love this. This comes every week. This is great. Great article in it. I think it's like 170 a year for this. Comes every week, though, I think. Or, I mean, it comes all the time. Brick and mortar retailers concerned still roiling licensing industry. And it's an entire article about how the sports licensing business top to down jerseys blah 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 everything under the sun is really really soft quote everyone in sports licensing needs to be concerned about brick and mortar retail said john killian president and ceo at licensed novelty product market leader wincraft and if you have a store you should definitely sign up for wincraft it's it's brick and mortar only um, they have some really cool, have a ton of items. Really good if like a, a local team in your area blows up. You can sign up for Wincraft, get some pennants. I remember I used to sell some of that stuff on eBay because I had a brick and mortar. So I had a Wincraft account so I could get some of that stuff. Uh, that stuff sells. So uh, I trust what John Killian says. Again, quote, everyone in sports licensing needs to be concerned about brick and mortar retail, said John Killian, president and CEO at licensed novelty product leader Wincraft. You've seen over 900 retail rooftops disappear over the last nine months, and those aren't being replaced. You look at retailers like Dick Sporting Goods and Lids, and you see it's all about marketing and retail experience. Compelling. So the struggles with brick and mortar retail and even specific to licensed sports. It's not exclusive to you sports card guys. So, uh, you know, oftentimes I hear how difficult, oh, it is to run a hobby shop and how difficult uh, life is because of Panini and Tops and eBay fees and blah, 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 blah. Guys, stop complaining. It's difficult for everybody. It's difficult for Dick Sporting Goods. It's difficult for Sears, which will go bankrupt. J.C. Penney's, Macy's, Abercrombie and Fitch, Kmart. Apparel specialists, including American Apparel and the Limited, are closing all of their 350 plus stores that follows last year's shutdowns of the Sports Authority, Sports Chalet, City Sports, Eastern Mountain Sports, and Golf Smith. On and on and on and on down the line, guys. Whole feature article about the troubles of brick and mortar retail as it relates to licensed sports cards, uh, as it relates to licensed sports goods. 
So your struggles are not unique to you if you have a hobby shop. And you need not look to Panini or Tops or Kevin Isaacson or Beckett to save your fucking problems. What, you, what we really need is an influx of collectors. And I think one way to do that is open up things like the Upper Deck EPAC site. Don't restrict what people can and can't buy. Shops can be a supplement to a growing hobby. Guys with knowledge, and I'll talk about, you know, my one month selling on eBay, Amazon, and check out my cards. Well, certainly nothing to write home about. This is selling on those platforms is the last thing on my mind and is the last thing that puts food on my plate. A lot of you dealers, a lot of you guys who have been in the game for so long have a lot of corporate knowledge. And if you applied it more, maybe if you hustle a little more, I guarantee you could make way more money than you do now. And you wouldn't be as reliant. As you are on the new card companies. That's why people got so mad at Upper Deck. Because you guys are too reliant on these card companies. Stop. They're reliant on the rookies <laughs> that, <laughs> that perform. Bottom fucking line. They overproduced 2015 16 Upper Deck Series 1 hockey. They tried to make too much of it, and the motherfucker's card is worth 250 You can't make enough of these cards if the guy is good. If the guy is perceived to be great or has the potential to be great. Make as many fucking cards as you can. Get as many people into the hobby as you can. And I think Upper Deck has done their very best. Because they get bombarded every day with calls, emails, people in person complaining about this platform. And if I were them, I would tell these motherfuckers, stop complaining. And you should have been buying his cards at 150 because they've gone up over $100 in less than a year. I'm trying to figure out if you're a hobby shop, what is there to fucking complain about? What do you do all day? the fuck do you do all day just today let me go back and I better click refresh on this because this fucking updates every second 14 fucking boxes sold today on Amazon I don't know what the fuck I'm doing I haven't had a fucking card store in nine years I haven't bought a box of cards in four years. I didn't have a federal tax ID number. I didn't have a California tax ID number. Those things took 10 fucking minutes to get. A little bit of fucking research about the amount of prime subscribers on Amazon what sells on Amazon 14 fucking boxes today if I drop my price a couple bucks I'm making about seven bucks each on these if I drop my price a little bit like how I did the other day I ran out about 12 in one day but I ran out of everything I have these boxes are the dog shit of the fucking dog shit as well I probably shouldn't be talking as much about this because I'm going to throw several grand at this or more and try to run out a hundred fucking boxes a day and wave my fucking dick at these motherfuckers. If I can sell 14, I just bought a hundred more tomorrow, uh, yesterday. I'll be coming this week. Amazon isn't for you fucking little kids out there who complain about eBay. This is so hard. Trust me. Amazon isn't that easy to figure out. 
I'm starting to get a little bit of the hangout of it after only 30 days. Sold 14 fucking boxes today. Wait till I start blasting fucking my sponsored products. Getting that dialed in. Getting my fucking my PPC dialed in. I barely turned those on. I've sold two things. Crank those up a notch when I have the inventory to support it. And blast through a hundred fucking boxes per fucking day. It's not that fucking hard. There are a lot of examples about guys hustling to make some money. So I can't figure out you guys who traipse to Vegas and traipse to Honolulu and traipse to these places. And it's the, the, the complaining is notorious. Stop complaining. You could sell 100 boxes a day on fucking Amazon. Boxes that nobody fucking wants. Aside from customers on Amazon. Hope that fucking sinks in. It's not fucking Panini Flawless. Tops Transcendent. These are the worst fucking boxes you can buy. Probably could easily sell 100 on eBay and Amazon combined. I'm trying to do 100 a day on Amazon. It's not that fucking hard. Stop complaining. You're going to hear some complaining over the next few days. And you wonder, some of you hobby shops who have been complaining a long time, you wonder year after year why your complaints fall on deaf ears. Stop complaining that Tops is going to sell stuff direct on their websites. Stop complaining that Upper Deck is going to sell stuff via e Upper Deck EPAC. Stop complaining that Tops has put maybe potentially hundreds, tens of uh, maybe hundreds of million dollars into these apps that have nothing fucking to do with you. Again, they hired 10 people at 100K each for their, quote, studio in Orlando, the Tops Digital Studio. 100 fucking K each. And that's just people they just hired. These fucking apps are still insane. I mean, the amount of people you're able to reach on mobile, you know, now that they're given with, you know, the Obama phones that probably get sh shut down here by Trump, uh, uh, quietly or maybe not so much, but better go get your old Obama phone if you uh, qualify for that. But I see uh, you guys maybe don't know anything about that, but literally you walk down the street and you in Stockton, you get hit up for money and you see these tents of people giving away these Obama phones. So, um, so, you know, people can access tops, upper deck, Panini doesn't do a very good job of it. But people can access these companies a lot easier than they can access you. So you need to concentrate on what you can control. Your own local market. Building a customer base in your own local niche. Maximizing online as much as you fucking can. And in five minutes, I'll talk about what I did for one month on eBay, Amazon, and check out my cards. You at least need to be taking advantage of those three channels. You should have some kind of web presence, website, Yelp uh, page, uh, a number of other, and obviously all the social media accounts. Those should be staying active for you. But if you're in the shop every day or if you have somebody working in the shop every day, these are things that should be getting done. And I guess if they're not getting done because you're too busy, because you have too many customers, I guess that's a good thing. I guess something happened. Then keep do, doing however these people are coming in the door or however you're getting these orders. Continue to nurture that. It's not that hard, guys. None of this is very hard. Try to sell Yu-Gi-Oh boxes on Amazon. Try to sell Lego products on Amazon. Try to sell something Nike on Amazon. Try to sell something Under Armour on Amazon. And watch not only what you have to apply for and then sometimes have to pay for. There aren't that many restrictions on sports cards. 
that Tops doesn't require distributor letters and a letter from them to sell on there as Konami does with Yu-Gi-Oh. It's not that fucking hard. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I sold 14 fucking boxes a day today of the dog shit of dog shit. I think part of the problem with some of you hobby shops is you chase these new products and you chase these customers who are chasing these new products. Get off the crack fiend. There, get off the crack fiend. I could get a thousand of these boxes tomorrow that I'm making seven bucks each on. And if I can sell a hundred a day, I don't think I could sell a hundred a day, I bet I could sell 20 a day. They were selling before they even got back onto Amazon. It's not that fucking hard. A lot of you guys should know way more about the hobby than I do. Don't take that I'm doing this fucking podcast that I know all this shit about the hobby. Most of you know 10 times more about these players, these cards, these sets, the rarity, the condition, how to get them graded, have more connections to customers. I'm trying to get motherfuckers to buy 49ers tickets. I don't know people who fucking want sports cards. Stop fucking complaining. It's not that fucking hard. The other day I sold 12 boxes on Amazon. Probably would have sold way more because my price was lower. But I ran out of inventory. Reloaded. Sold another 14 today. At a higher price. It's not that fucking hard. I shouldn't just be able to log in and be able to do that. There should be a bunch of you guys. Who have been locked that up for years. For whatever reason, you're caught stroking your fucking dick in Vegas complaining. I have no fucking idea why. I sure as hell wouldn't be complaining if there were ways to sell dozens. I have barely any inventory on there. Astonishing. It's the same motherfuckers who complain about Upper Deck EPAC and a Connor McDavid card that's not autographed, not serial numbered, not hard to get. I know people that have hundreds of copies of these. I had four of them. There's motherfuckers who have thousands of these. It's worth $250. $250. Not autographed. Not serial numbered. Mass produced. Admitted mass produced by the company. Email Upper Deck and ask them to compare the print run of last year's Series 1 to this year's Series 1 with Austin Matthews. Matthews. You'll probably get a straight answer. This shit ain't that fucking hard. One month uh, selling cards on eBay. Check out my cards. And Amazon. Another thing that's really not that hard and kind of fun. I had some time to kill. Next couple months. As evident of the being able to record four or five podcasts. In the last couple of months here. Or more. Got a couple... Months to kill. Sent way too much money to the government on my fucking taxes. Realized I needed to spend more money on my businesses to try to lever up even higher up into a new stratosphere. Maybe we'll get some tax cuts or maybe uh, I'll just keep paying (laughs) the rate that it is now. Needed to do that. So I was like, well, why don't I sell some stuff on eBay and Amazon? I have an article. It is linked to on. It is not on Sports Card Radio, but it is linked to on Sports Card Radio on the show notes to this show number 10. It is on openacardstore.com. One best way to get to the article is I have a latest article tab. And it will probably be the top article for a little while because I don't post too many articles on there. But I thought this was good. So give me a click. Go. Check it out. You can also subscribe to my newsletter there. Not this many people in the hobby do this. I break down one month of selling cards, eBay, checking my cards, and Amazon. Briefly, because again, I want you to click on it and go check it out, but I'll break down some of the numbers. On eBay, I had 88 total orders. It ended up being about 109 things. You know, you sell multiple things uh, in some orders. Total sales, $1,369. Net selling cost, 
That includes the eBay store fee of $30, all my UPS and FedEx shipping fees, the eBay final value fees, and the PayPal fees. Those total $543.63. Shipping supplies that I used in the course of selling these 88 orders, that was $22.69. The bubble mailers, the tape, the mailing labels. I found some good ones that you can just print out and stick on. Uh, really good ones actually they were like 200 for only 10 bucks it was a really good deal comparable to like the name brand ones cost of goods sold so what i what it cost me to buy these 88 orders 492 dollars and 44 cents you could play with the accounting there like i could that could be all over the map your cost of goods sold i could see how you could really play with this because you're getting all this inventory from various places a lot of times. Some of the stuff like his carts from the flea market that I paid X amount of dollars for. And it was all these boxes. You could really play with these numbers. Um, and, you know, work them to your advantage or disadvantage. I tried to be the best I could with these. So, in total, again, $1,369 in sales. Um, after my net selling cost. After my shipping supplies cost, after my cost of goods sold, total profit $310. What I have left, I have about $4,800 in inventory, probably a less than this, probably actually a little closer to four. I sold some things this month, actually, actually the last couple of days have been really good. Sold some things that, that lowers my inventory value. I also noticed a, a mistake on one of the accounting, about a $300 mistake, so it lowers it. I probably have about a total inventory of $4,000, so I probably put about $5,000 into it. My total shipping supplies, I have $74 in bubble mailer, tapes, mailing labels, and uh, kind of uh, mailing supplies. And that's at, at the end of the month. Also, on this article, I, I literally show you pictures of every single order that I got on eBay. I don't know how many people do that, especially in the sports card category. Everybody's all hush-hush. Well, fuck you. Here's every single fucking order that I have. You can go take a look at it. Um, Amazon, again, I'm a little more tight-lipped about because, you know, if people can't barely figure out eBay or can barely scratch out a living with a shop or can barely scratch out a living when Upper Deck overproduces a kid's uh, non-serial numbered, non-autographed card and it's worth 250 bucks and people are complaining about it, you guys aren't going to be able to fucking uh, figure out Amazon. Looks like a couple sellers have. Wowzer It's like the king of selling boxes and, and sports stuff uh it, it looks like on um amazon if i can even approach probably what this guy sells i'll be pretty happy and uh, it's pretty easy again sold 27 uh items last month on amazon my total fees i just put a lot because it is a lot advertising i only spent two dollars and 68 cents uh, those are the sponsored products again i don't have very much inventory my total profit even though I didn't know what the hell I was doing, didn't know what the hell was going to sell, didn't even know all these things about Amazon, which are much more confusing and difficult than eBay. Again, I spoke about how you have to get a letter from Konami and three distributors to even sell fucking Yu-Gi-Oh shit. Now, you can back channel some shit on there. Again, that's more knowledge that you have to obtain, but I don't know. This shit ain't that hard to me. Made $104 on that. Now you might say, oh, you made $104. Yeah, I can make that in a second selling sports tickets. But here's the thing that's really encouraging, and this is why I get excited. My total inventory at the end of the month listed on Amazon, what I spent on it was only $943. I like had nothing on there. Like literally like, what is that, 50 boxes and most. Maybe I had 30, 40 boxes on there. So it didn't take much of an investment and it sure as hell didn't take much time to sell this shit on Amazon once I figured out all the rules, restriction, what I was going to be getting charged, how do you do this, X, Y, and Z. Once I figured all that stuff out and once I found a couple products that sold, I would just order as much as I can and in some cases it would show up. I would literally just peek in the box, make sure that everything looked good, pack it back up, Slap the labels you have to slap on it and send it on its way. That's not hard. There's nothing to complain about there. 
going to be hearing a lot of probably complaining in the next few days about things Panini's doing, about things Tops are doing, how about, you know, Eberdex screwing everybody and the, all these hobby shops are getting screwed. The market on these fucking boxes on Amazon, the world's largest fucking marketplace or the United States largest fucking marketplace. Here's the thing about Amazon, too. I'm saying way too fucking much, too. This is ridiculous. I should be fucking charging for this fucking podcast. I'm saying way fucking too much, but I don't give a fuck. You can make way more selling tickets than you can. I think even if you sold 100 boxes a day on Amazon, I make more selling tickets in four months than if you did that all year. So, but this, this is brilliant. This is a great side business. This is a great side business. And this is what I want to fucking turn it into. And one of the very unique things about sports cards is everybody right now on Amazon, all the big sell, a lot of the big sellers, anybody pretty much selling anything is complaining how everybody's getting undercut by China on everything, on every product. And it's like super cheap. Like somehow you can ship something from China for like nothing because stuff that I would sell for five bucks or 10 bucks and make a couple bucks on somehow you can ship it from China for like $2 and 29 cents. Everybody's complaining on Amazon, but guess what? You can't bootleg sports cards. Guess what doesn't get made in China? Sports cards. Guess what you never see? Like counterfeit sports card boxes or products or or supplies. You ever see bootleg Ultra Pro stuff? You ever see bootleg Panini basketball boxes? No. No. Those motherfuckers are caught up on the cell phone accessories and the yoga mats and the shit that sells like all fucking day on Amazon. And people are getting destroyed by these China sellers. But not sports cards. Not sports cards. These motherfuckers in China aren't going to get a bunch of fucking dog shit baseball boxes. That's not going to fucking happen. You guys who have had a hobby shop or been in the game for quote unquote 20 years or your quote unquote your whole fucking life. How are you not making hand over fist on Amazon, on eBay? I made 300 bucks just throwing 5K at this. Didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Hadn't sold on eBay and God knows how long except for those Chris Bryant cards. That's what kind of rekindled my interest. I was like, oh, that was kind of easy. I wish I had a bunch of Chris Bryant cards. I wish that was a, I had a Chris Bryant tree I could just go pluck from. I think we all do. But I had 1,369 sales and roughly, again, you could really play with these accounting numbers. I roughly made about 300 bucks. So, you know, we're less than 30% there, but that's money. And at any kind of volume, you guys should have way more than $5,000 in inventory. Way more. I'm playing in the fucking kiddie pool. Most of you guys, most of you, you know, well-known complainers. Who've been in the game, quote unquote, your whole fucking life. Why don't you have this locked down? I don't understand it. Questions, it puts into question your intelligence. So when you complain, you should wonder why nobody apparently gives a fuck. Check out my cards, man. I had one of my best months, literally since like 2013. Couple reasons why. One, I ran two sales. Rarely I ever do that. And uh, I did have a one of the, one of the big cards sold. That uh, I sold like an exclusive Young Gun that was worth a buck fifty. Not a uh, Matthews or a, um, not Austin Matthews or Connor McDavid. Some other cat that I pulled in a pack on EPAC, and it was worth one hundred fifty bucks. Again, if you're not on EPAC, and you're sitting around complaining about it, there's money to be made there, guys. There's money to be fucking made. I've made money just opening boxes and selling the cards, let alone the trading and the hundreds, if not thousands of Connor McDavid's you could have got instead of sitting around and complaining about it. I had one of my best months on check out my cards. I sold 1,253 cards. That's uh, shoot my math. I'm, I'm really bad at math unless it's slow numbers, but uh, 
You know, that's like 40 cards a day. Advertising fees, $18. That's two separate three-day sales. And my storage fees was $8.27 for the month. So my total revenue from that was $550.80. So I'm really happy about that. Sold 1,253 cards. Only cost me roughly 36 cents in quote fees. My revenue was 550. And guess what? A lot of this money, you can turn around and get gift certificates of blowout sports cards. I just buy some boxes from blowout sports cards. That guess what? I go or, or turn around and sell on Amazon and boom. There's no quote unquote cash out fee that I'm really missing out on. Uh, there I'm able actually to get a lot of the cash out quote unquote cash out fee back and it's uh, no risk for me because these are cards that are sitting on check out my cards in, in the article a lot of people ask me about this and ask me about check out my cards I've broken it all down it's all on YouTube every question that you could probably possibly have I broke down an account that I've sold over 75,000 cards show you exactly what I've done no hiding no nothing no bullshit so we'll go check that out. And I also show an, a recent update of my stats, which, you know, are not bad. I have 34,000 cards for sale. Lifetime, I've bought 107,000 cards. I've sold seven, 77,000 cards. Total sales, 31,385. And um, that's, again, on check out my cards. So go check that out again that's on open a card store if i can get shit cranked up you'll be seeing a lot more sports card information get cranked up if i can get somebody hired and uh, working on my card shit my beanie baby shit and all the other websites i have that need some tender love and care a couple other things twitter I uh, got a message on Twitter about PayPal microtransactions. You can actually set up a PayPal account just for microtransactions that charges you a lot less. So if you're doing like some plain white envelopes or maybe you have a website where you sell like you're trying to like slang some like 99 cent cards or dollar 99 cards. You could easily do the math because you could go figure out what are you getting charged for these PayPal microtransactions versus what would you get paid for a regular transaction it was like 35 cents plus three cents i mean it's ridiculous the micro transactions if you're doing some plain white envelope stuff on e ebay you definitely i would assume these guys are doing paypal micro transaction um accounts to where you keep more of the money every transaction you do is processed through uh the fee so you probably would only you, you would probably need two separate PayPal accounts. I appreciate the person who reached out to me and told me about this. I wouldn't have known about this. And I think this is really something cool because a lot of people have different business models. A lot of ways to hustle cards. Again, guys, stop complaining. There's a lot of people who want cards. There's very little access to cards. Hobby shops have dried up. That should be an advantage to you if you still have one and you're still able to make it. You should actually look at it as a positive because there's less competition. If you have any kind of online presence, any kind of social media chops, doing any type of advertising, you could get thousands of people per day online looking at your inventory online or being aware of your shop. You should be able to get a large reach in your community, advertising on Facebook, Yelp, having a presence in the community, email, flyers, fucking stand out on the corner naked, give away a fucking Connor McDavid Young Gun card that's worth $250. There's a lot of ways. This isn't that hard. Sports card, be proud be excited that you know about not that many people know about sports cards not that many people know about beanie babies why do you think my fucking phone blows up who knows that the 1998 1999 kicks bear that quote unquote has tag errors well that's all fucking bullshit there are no fucking tag errors they probably made five million of those fucking things and i have to f kind of uh respond to these in a way and break it to these people that their five thousand dollar fucking quote unquote air kicks bear is probably worth 99 fucking cents be proud that we have a hobby where some kid who most of you wouldn't know who connor fucking mcdavid was if he walked into his your fucking shop and said hey i'm connor fucking mcdavid let's be fucking real 
but we live in a hobby where Upper Deck can openly and widely admit that they needed this guy to save the company. So they overproduced Series 1. They sent a bunch to EPAC. They introduced EPAC with it. Guys bought case after case after case after case after case. Overproduced it. Easy to get. I had four of them. Nobody knows who he is. And his fucking non-autographed, non-serial numbered, overproduced, easy to get rookie card is worth 250 fucking dollars. Do I need to fucking say any more? We'll just fucking end it with that.